And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Sarasaurus, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a sauropodomorph that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Arizona in the U.S., found in the Cayenta Formation from the Silty Faces. It looked kind of like a ground sloth. Really? Well, it's a sauropodomorph, not a sauropod. Interesting. So did it have a really short neck? No, it had a long neck, but it had powerful hands. Okay. Because sor- because sloths have pretty short necks. so that's like It's more about the hands that make it sloth-like. Okay. So like a ground sloth with a really long neck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, its hands were smaller than a human's, but they were more powerfully built, and they had these big claws. So I'm guessing this was a really small sauropodomorph if it's considered to have powerful hands that are smaller than a human's. Yeah, it's considered mid-sized, about 13 feet or 4 meters long and weighed 440 pounds or 200 kilograms. Hmm. Still, that's still pretty heavy for only human-sized hands. <laughs> it's true. Although if uh, huge claws were on those hands, that does make a big difference. Yeah. The longest claw was on the first finger of the hand. So Cerasaurus may have been an omnivore. It also had powerful shoulders, and its scapula was hourglass-shaped. For big muscle attachments. Mm-hmm. As I mentioned, it had a long neck. It also had a robust build. It walked on two legs, and its forelimbs were shorter than the hind limbs, which you would expect walking on two legs. The humerus was 61% the length of the femur. Okay, yeah, so like two-thirds the length, maybe, mm-hmm. roughly, for the forelimbs versus hind limbs. It also had long thigh bones, and its hind legs were column-like. They're a bit larger, and the neck vertebrae was lengthening. So you start to see these more sauropod characteristics. Cerasaurus helps show that sauropod traits may have developed in smaller animals first, and that helps show how sauropods grew to be so big. Cerasaurus didn't have air sacs in the skeleton, also known as the postcranial skeletal pneumaticity. It had large eyes. It didn't have a good sense of smell. There's no evidence it had a beak. But its lower jaw curved downwards toward the tip. Oh, weird. I guess we've seen that in some other sauropodomorphs. Yeah. It had 20 teeth on each side of the upper jaw. And the lower jaw also had 20 teeth. And these were, quote unquote, moderately heterodont teeth (laughs) that were serrated. So somewhat different. Yeah, moderately heterodont. That's funny. Yeah. So I guess that's why it might be an omnivore, because it's got different teeth. And you'd think like, well, maybe these teeth were for the meat and these teeth were for the vegetables. And also, why did it have these big claws? Yeah. <laughs> the type species is Cerasaurus orofontinalis. And it was found on a field trip in 1997 by researchers and then named in 2011 by Timothy Rowe, Hans Dieter Seuss, and Robert Rees. It took three 10-week field sessions over three years to excavate. They also found a Dilophosaurus specimen. Wow, that was a pretty good session. Yeah. Or pretty good 10-week sessions. Multiple sessions, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the holotype of Cerasaurus is nearly complete. It's an articulated skeleton and a fragmentary disarticulated skull. That one's known as TMM436462. They also found another partial skeleton a different skeleton, so it's TMM436463, and a nearly complete skull of another specimen, that one's MCZ8893. Thanks for the specimen numbers, I needed those. I mentioned them because I wanted to make sure it's clear that these are three different specimens. Gotcha. So the holotype is a mature individual, but maybe not a full adult yet. But it's nearly complete, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. The nearly complete skull, the MCZ1, was originally thought to be Massospondylus sp, so some kind of species of Massospondylus. That skull was crushed and split, caused by swelling and shrinking of the clay around it after it was buried, and that skull was more juvenile than the holotype. The MCZ skull was found in 1978 and later known as the, quote, unnamed Cayenta prosauropod. It was also informally known as the rockhead specimen because it was found from the base of a geographic feature known as rockhead. <laughs> Not because it had a particularly rock-like head? <laughs> no. <laughs> so the genus name, Sarasaurus, is in honor of Sarah 
Mrs. Ernest Butler, a philanthropist who helped fund the Dino Pit exhibit at the Austin Nature and Science Center. Timothy Rowe helped create the exhibit and told Sarah, quote, if she really raised a million dollars to build the Dino Pit, I'd name a dinosaur after her. <laughs> he followed through. Good thing he had a dinosaur to name. Yeah. She raised that money in a year. Well done. Yeah. The species name Orofontanellus refers to Gold Spring, Arizona, where the holotype was found. It means gold of the spring in Latin. Interesting. Oh, because it's Gold Spring, Arizona, so it's gold of the spring mm -hmm. dinosaur. Now, the discovery of Sarasaurus helped show that dinosaurs became more dominant after the end of the Triassic extinction event, and not by being so fierce and outcompeting all other animals. Because this doesn't look very fierce. Well, the ground sloths are pretty fierce, so I don't know. I think it's more when it appeared. Oh, because it's after an extinction event? Yes, because Sarasaurus was from the early Jurassic, and this is after the Triassic ended. There's this biggest extinction event, and now we're seeing different dinosaurs. Gotcha. Timothy Rowe said in an article by the University of Texas at Austin College of Natural Sciences that dinosaurs, quote, were humbler, more opportunistic creatures. They didn't invade the neighborhood. They waited for the residents to leave, and when no one was watching, they moved in, end quote. So they're more like squatters than burglars? I guess. <laughs> or just opportunistic. In 2018, Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe analyzed Sarasaurus with additional prepared fossils and CT scans, and they found Sarasaurus to be more closely related with sauropodomorphs from South Africa, South America, China, and Antarctica than sauropodomorphs from North America, which is interesting because it was found in North America. At the time that Sarasaurus was named, only three sauropodomorphs were known from the early Jurassic of North America. That's Ankysaurus and Sayatod, and another one that has not yet had a formal description, but it's kind of known as Fendusaurus. Fendusaurus. Interesting. So those three are not closely related. They're not part of the same clade. It appears that there were no ornithischians or sauropodomorphs in North America in the Triassic. At least no fossils have been found yet. And if that's true, it ends up being that they really weren't there in the Triassic, then Sarasaurus is one of the earliest North American sauropodomorphs. Hmm. And it possibly came to North America after some physical barrier was removed at the end of the Triassic, or it's possible it took dinosaurs a long time to expand their territory. Yeah, that makes sense because there was a lot of competition still in the Triassic from lots of other groups. And mm -hmm. even in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, there were always other animals to compete with in the different niches. Mm -hmm. So Sarasaurus lived in an area with a lot of streams, ponds, and lakes. And other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included theropods, such as Dilophosaurus, and Cayenta venator, Coelophysis, and Thyreophorans, such as Scalitosaurus and Scutellosaurus. For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino or click the link on the left. <laughs>